Um, and thanks not only to James, but also to Hazel Johnson, who's sitting next to James up there, who's Gender Institute Manager, um, for having uh, set up the reception afterwards. The subject of tonight's talk, Female Genital Mutilation, or FGM, which some people refer to by the more neutral term, uh, female circumcision, or FGC, female genital cutting, taking place right here in London, could not be more timely. As you're no doubt aware from recent press coverage, girls in Britain are more at risk of this practice than anywhere else in Europe. David Cameron has pledged £35 million to eradicate FGM within a generation, which is the biggest ever international investment aimed at tackling it. In the immediate term, our International Development Minister, Lynn Featherston, who happens to be my local MP in Harringay, and I did invite tonight, but I can't see her in the audience yet, um, intends to use this money to reduce FGM by 30% in five years. This is critical given that over 65,000 women living in the UK have already undergone cutting, and an estimated further 30,000 girls are at risk. A large number of girls of these girls are of Gambian origin, who are forced into the procedure when they go on holiday to visit relatives. A Gambian situation came to light a couple of weeks ago when one 11-year-old girl wrote to the charity Equality Now, who's actually one of uh, Isotu's partners, pleading help, when she made the dramatic discovery that this had happened to her older sister. In this regard, it could not be more apposite to have Dr. Torre with us tonight, which brings me to my dedicated introduction to our very distinguished guest, who, incidentally, has a long association with the UK. Isa too studied for her PhD under Professor Melissa Leach at the University of Sussex, and two of Isa II's daughter, Naima and Sally, also live here in the UK. And we had the pleasure last night of um, celebrating Isa II's birthday uh, with Sally and my husband Chris, who's um, manically taking photographs now. <laughs> um, now, Sally is in the final year of her degree in health and social policy at the London Metropolitan University, and we're very pleased to have you here, Sally. I apologise if my introduction is a little lengthier uh, than usual, but I promise not to take too much time. But as I hope you will appreciate, it's hard to do justice to Isatu in only a few words, especially as I've known Isatu personally um, uh, and had the great pleasure of working with her for nearly uh, a decade now. Isatu is founder and executive director of the Gambia Committee on Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children, known for short as GAMCOTRAP. And I'm very grateful for that acronym, uh, uh, Isatu, because it's quite a, a lengthy uh, title to an NGO. This is an NGO which has campaigned tirelessly for women's and girls' rights since the 1980s, and which has been a leader in the struggle to eliminate FGM. This has not exactly been an easy challenge, and Isatu and her small coterie of very loyal staff, including Ami Bojang Sisaho and Omar Dibba, who I know very well, have encountered several different along the way. Thanks to their incredible work in various regions of the Gambia, several communities have come to support the rights of the girl child and to abandon the practice of female circumcision. I myself had the privilege of attending the third major dropping of the knife ceremony at Jarasoma, the lower, lower river region, in July 2011, at which 20 circumcisers laid down their knives in a spectacular show of community solidarity and celebration. This event would have been unthinkable 20 or 30 years ago in a country where around three quarters of women have undergone type one or type two circumcision. We have to remember that there is no law forbidding FGM in the Gambia, but ISA too has recently been involved in drawing up a draft bill for the prohibition of FGM, which is currently with the office of the Vice President. Extra interest should be added to this process by the fact that in December 2012, the UN General Assembly accepted a resolution on the elimination of FGM. If the Gambian bill becomes law, and let's hope it does, then one of ISATU's and GAMCOTRAP's major missions will be realized, and with luck, usher in an unprecedented era of respect for the rights of women and girls in the Gambia. On a more personal note, I first met ISATU in 2004, shortly after embarking on my own research in the Gambia with my colleague Dr. Gareth Jones, um, and then subsequently on my own account on gender, generation and poverty, 
and later with Alice Evans <coughs> on gender and sexuality. Isatu's energy, bravery, compassion and integrity impressed me from the very start and I have never failed to be struck by her sustained commitment to tackling the very deeply embedded gender inequalities facing women in the Gambia. This applies not only to her amazing work at the grassroots, but also at the highest levels of governance, including as member of the technical advisory body for the policy for the advancement of Gambian women. And ICT's endeavours have not been confined to the Gambia alone, but extend across the African uh, region in general, not to mention globally. To name but a few of her many activities, ICT has been a member of the Gender Action Team for the ratification of the African Protocol on Women's Rights, and she is Secretary Secretary General of the Inter-African Committee. This is a network of 28 countries working on FGM and gender-based violence. And despite all this activity, ISATU still manages to write and publish prolifically for varied audiences, and I myself have enjoyed the honour of being her co-author on two occasions now. One of our first joint ventures was to craft um, an overview of women and gender in the first ever post-independence collection <coughs> of essays on the Gambia by Gambians and Gambianist scholars. And I said, would you just pass me that book? <laughs> this is even bigger than the International Handbook of Gender Equality, which I compiled a couple of years ago. It is a mammoth editorial feat, and I'm very happy to say that the editorial work for this volume was carried out by Abdullah Sen, Ibrahim Sisse, and Ibrahim Sal. And um, we've got Abdullah Sen in the audience, and has Ibrahim arrived yet, or is he on Gambian maybe time? <laughs> Very pleased to see you. Um, and uh, 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 basically, uh, we are very lucky to have Professor Sen and Ibrahim uh, Cisse in our midst, and so this is going to be a, an extra special encounter, I think, for all of us, because um, many Gambians are diasporic, and we all know each other by reputation, and for many of us, this is the first time we've actually been able to encounter each other in person. So it's a very emotional uh, uh, situation. Before I hand over to Waisatu, I should also say that Abdullah and Abraima joined with me and others, including Dr. David Perfect. David, are you here? Not yet, but he will probably be coming again on Gambian Maybe time. Um, uh, but, but basically, we supported Gamco Trap's nomination for the 2013 <coughs> Thomas J. Dog Prize in International Justice and Human Rights. While this is currently in the process of deliberation, already ISO2's achievements and services to others have led to several other awards. One is the US Ambassadorial Prize for International Women of Courage. Another is Gambian of the Year 2008. This is a very rare honor, which, is a, which only one other female national has earned to date. And third, ISO2 was also voted winner of the 100 Heroines of the World on Human Rights by the Rochester Women's Health Project at Rutgers University. I think you will gather why ISATU has been worthy of these accolades as she now addresses us on the politics of female genital mutilation, where external and locally led initiatives are bringing positive change. 